If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, for about 38 minutes, we have some nice conversation. We talk about making love to music. Oh my God. <laughs> we, yeah. We talk about my heavy petting. To R and B, God, that was back when I was uh, fourteen years old. I think heavy petter. Yeah. Uh, Adam Wearing talks Jankos. Adam talks about Black Mirror, a new uh, sh- uh, well, not a new show, but it's a show that we uh, have been watching on Netflix. Uh, we talk about the challenges of the information age, the media's influence on the way we think and feel. Evil bastards, we're getting manipulated. Oh, and then we mention the Organifi Christmas blend. We actually invented it. This is where you take the green juice and mix it with the red juice. Uh, and then I talk a little bit about the benefits of turmeric. And then uh, Santa Claus pees on you. By the way, if you want to get a discount for those products, go to Organifi Shop. That's O R G A N I F I Shop dot com and enter the code Mind Pump at checkout. Then we get into the fitness questions. The first question was, "What do we think of optimal caffeine intake? How much is too much? And what are the benefits of taking caffeine?" We also talk about the detriments. So it's a well-balanced answer. I love coffee. To that energized question. Uh, then there was someone who asked us, if, do we use our brain's full capacity if we lose connection to Justin muscles? Justin doesn't really. Yeah. Nah. Uh, <laughs> like the ones on our feet. It's actually a fascinating topic. We get deep with it. Uh, I don't know why I said it that way. Very uh, deep. <laughs> then we talk about the sled. Uh, what does it do for your body and how do you fit it inside your workout, uh, Justin moved his eyes up when I said inside. Yeah, I, I didn't yeah. say what you thought I was. Gonna I don't say. know. You're just you know you're uh, very sexual. Actually, right we now. have videos uh, of sled training on our YouTube channel, Mind Pump TV, so you can even reference there. Finally, one of our favorite topics. Somebody asked us about entrepreneurship. Can it be taught? Can you spot an individual who has a lot of potential as on, as an entrepreneur? When did we realize we were entrepreneurs? Uh, at what age? You will know. Uh, really, really great topic. We love talking about that stuff. If you're a fitness professional building something on social media, uh, if you're looking about going, if you think about going into business for yourself, or if you're just interested in the subject, uh, or you want to rep some fit tea. You know what I mean? It's towards the end of the episode. Um, finally, this month, get Maps Prime for free if you enroll in any Maps program or any Maps bundle. However. Our super bundle, which is one year's worth of exercise programming, already includes Maps Prime. So if you enroll in the super bundle, you'll get Maps Prime Pro for free. And then you basically Dude, you're, have, you're gonna have everything everything That's badass. that you need uh, to get your body feeling and looking incredible. Uh, for all of those programs, all you got to do is go to mindpumpmedia.com and sign up. You know what I like is uh, Richard Marks. Oh my God! He like never got enough credit for his you really amazing so? ballads. You really think so? Yeah, I think he got just enough credit. You're right. I think you're right. I don't think I don't <laughs> yeah. think he needs more. What was the one song? It's not almost paradise. It was something like that. Uh, I don't remember. Almost paradise. Oh yeah, Is that that's him. We looking on heaven's door. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Who are most paradise? In between your paradise. Uh, could we ask for more? That's, that's that's Richard Marks. I don't know. I think so. I don't know if that is, is that. I don't know. Maybe it's not. I don't remember. Well, I used to call him Dick Marks. Yeah. So that, you know. Be honest. How many times have you made love to that particular song? Zero. Do Zero you, times? Are you, are you a make yeah. love to music guy? I was more of like a... Yeah. I, I, are either one of you guys make love no, to music guys? No. no. That's weird. Brain FM now, it is weird. but uh, it's know, very it's weird. A it's story. weird to play music. I don't know. To, to, Some people are really into that. And they have to have like a certain beat, so... You know, <laughs> well, like, I don't know about that, but I definitely... I had a, I had a girlfriend, I, I had a girlfriend in uh, high school who would get instantly horny if we played... If R&B. Like R&B, yeah. It was really weird. Like, it was almost like... And so was, you, you didn't do yeah, that? What though? is that? Like, you didn't, I never understood Oh, are you kidding that. me? That I put R&B on every time. I just asked you that. No, 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 no. <laughs> I didn't have sex, though. I was a virgin at this point. Oh. oh. But I'd put it on, you and then we'd... mess around. Yeah, we'd do the, you know... Some the, heavy the, petting. The little touch. <laughs> <laughs> R&B, some heavy petting to play, uh, R. Kelly. Play a yeah, game a of, uh, you know, touchy touch. <laughs> I'm <laughs> still in the closet. Over the pants, touchy touch. How old were you at this time? Um... 
14. Mm. You want to know how this is how powerful women need to. I, well, I think women do get to understand. They do understand this later on in life. How much power they have over men, especially when we're younger. Duh. I, when I was 14, I had dislocated my knee. I actually told the story. Oh, in I think they're well aware episode. of this. Yeah. I had yeah. dislocated my knee. It's no, obvious. Well, they get aware of it later. And so I had to wear this straight knee brace. And so I couldn't bend my leg. So I had to wear this brace. But I could walk just kind of fucked up, you know, like I'd walk kind of weird. I used to walk to her house, which was like three miles away or something like that. Just hobbling. All the way over there yeah. to hang out for maybe 30 minutes before her mom got home. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, but it was all worth it because, you know, she'd touch me yeah. over my pants. <laughs> Wow. You know what I'm saying? And then yeah. I walk all the way home. That's worth it. And you just, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. would take a lot more now to do that. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah, yeah, just, I don't know how just hobbling with, with that and, and blue balls. All the way. <laughs> yeah. you know, the, 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 older, the older version, it would just bad. be more blunt and straightforward about like, am I going to get any uh, heavy petting? If I come <laughs> more? Because uh, I'm down to totally walk I mean, these three miles to get over there with this bad knee. Heavy great, but do you but, know the finisher technique? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? The finish. Yeah. Yeah, can we do full yeah, release? It has to accelerate at the end. <laughs> but uh, like, think like you know how? Remember how excited? I remember how like excited I could easily finish that way at that age, just over my pants. Oh, totally. Now I'm just like, come on now. Mm. Oh, you know what I'm I mean? Get but then you gotta walk home with that in your pants. <laughs> Which one of you two no, uh, was watching Black Mirror? Who's the Who's that the was Sal? That was He's me. All over it. Oh, uh, I, I seen like two episodes. Have you Have you continued to watch it? I watched all the episodes. Some of them are crappy, but some of them are really good. Okay, I've, I've seen a. Co- I watched a couple. I got sucked in last night. Which one did you watch? Uh, White Christmas and that one's fucking horrible, right? Great though. It's that, really, I mean, didn't it trip you? Like that would it, be terrible. It, well, not only, but it, but I mean, it was like. Fuck that! That could happen. <laughs> there's there's some really good. They did they did some good. A bunch of people have been inboxing me because of some of the stuff that we've said on the show, mm-hmm. and because of irresistible and technology and where it's going and some of the things to, to be fearful of or be cautious of. I should say, uh, people have been oh you should watch this episode of uh, Black Mirror. So I told Katrina and or she brought it up actually, and that's what reminded me. She's like. Uh, you, there's a show that people keep talking about at work. Uh, it's called Mirror. I'm like, oh, Black Mirror. And she's like, yeah, that's it. I'm like, yeah. A bunch of people have been inboxing me. I think Sal and Justin watch it. I haven't had a chance that to. That episode in particular was uh, disturbing. Yeah. It was like at the end of it, right? Aren't you like, damn. Yeah. 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 That is some fucked up shit. Good, good, good episode, man. And then I watched uh, the Waldo one. Where's Waldo one? Oh, what was that one about again? I can't think right now because mm. I have the black, I have the white Christmas one. In my the only head. one I saw was the one where like the eye would would capture everything like video. Oh yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you could like rewind it and like evaluate everybody's expression and you know how everything went down. Dude, that's weird. That was creepy. So that's weird. Um, I I didn't know this until I. What made me turn it on was that you don't have to watch it in order. There's different characters like it's in like almost, Twilight Zone. Yeah, no, they're, they're all like they're all different. different. Yeah, yeah, they're all different different episodes. They're all different. Um shows basically so, yeah so you could totally mm-hmm. like randomly go pick around mm-hmm. and so that's what we started doing it was like oh this title sounds interesting because it's related to this let's watch yeah, this i might one. do that yeah you've watched them all though i watched all of them because i got really into it and some of them are just like oh that was a crappy one there's a few that are stupid really mm-hmm. yeah but there's a few that are really 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 good like yeah that white, white christmas was one of them yeah i think the wall the wall one was really good too dude sure. white christmas disturbed my girl like we watched it together and afterwards she's like i feel weird I feel like yeah, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I told you right. So you were sitting there. I'm like, what if, what if, right now we're the copy version of ourselves right now? Like this. What, what if, what if we're the, our copy? There'd be yeah. no way of knowing. Yeah, like there's no way we know. Like, <laughs> so what would you, what would you do if you found that out? Like, what would you do if you found out? Like, I'm totally a program. I think software it, program. I think. What it, would you do? I think at that point Who you cares? just you have to embrace it, right? Because yeah. it doesn't change anything. That's the that's see that's it exactly yeah. right. Like because I I still like what's the, what's the I matter? still feel joy and sadness and happiness and love and I, I still have all the same feelings of I guess as the fucking real me does. So I guess would just embrace it. Like mm-hmm. I'd be like lucky me. I they made a cop smart me made a copy of me. You know. Mm. So I I, I can't I'm, I'm mad that I can't remember the Waldo one the first one that I watched because I wanted to share it with you guys because both of them were really good they it got me in into it I had, was not that intrigued to watch it and I thought fuck everyone keeps saying to watch this and uh, it does it goes right in line with a lot of the and my I guess my mind's there right now because I just finished that book Irresistible mm-hmm. that I posted about and it was a really good book and you know we just where we're at right now with tech uh, we don't have a lot of history to 
compare to. No. So, and it's it's actually interesting to me that we don't speculate a lot on this. You don't hear a lot of people talking about. You know, we're excited about all these new yeah. things that are coming. Like we're just all in this rush for some reason, like to just like come up with the coolest shit and like make everything so easy. Well, but is thing, that really what we should be doing? Things become normal very quickly, uh, but it's very different for the younger generation. I have young kids; very, very different for them than it is even for you know, definitely for my generation, but even the generation before them. It's changing so rapidly. Yeah, uh, it's. I was having a conversation with my my oldest and we were, you know, talking just about like the phones and and all this kind of stuff. And I was kind of describing to him like more again, like what we talked about here, like about why, like I'm going to kind of wait for a while before he can he can actually like have his own phone and um, justify. I I kind of like put put a question at him like uh, there was a chicken outside. I'm like, do you know um, the breed of chicken that is, you know, how do you go about finding that out? And so he starts to think about it and he's like, well, you know, I can Google it, of course, or, you know, maybe we could go back to the person that sold us the chicken, you know, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can ask somebody, you know, a neighbor and I'm just like trying to get him to critically think like, hmm, what happens if I don't have easy access to to information? How do I go about even getting it? So so this is something that like I'm trying to establish like critical thinking through you know, this process, you know, as he's kind of building and developing his education is so important. It's something that, like, nobody's going to have the ability to do at some point. So, I, I think you'll be taught not to. Yeah. I think you're going to be taught. It's already happening. Like, you are going to be one of the most valuable skills you have is just how to retrieve information. It won't so, be how to So, uh, let me ask you guys this, because yeah. you guys have kids that you guys can compare to. I, I don't, so I don't... Um, do you think that we are better or worse at critical thinking and using tools like, you know, Google and YouTube and TED Talks and to find information? Like, I, I find it really easy to get anything I need to know about anything. And I and I think like, God, I wish this was at the tip of my fingers mm-hmm. when I was, you know, 13 years old coming up through school. But it's still I, hyper dependent on that. So I have it? to look at it and then uh, my brain thinks about searching about it. If you if you take that away and you start thinking about it, like how do you even retrieve information you already have in your head? It's but see here and here's where I I can sometimes sometimes play devil's advocate. You know we lost a lot of skills uh, as humans. Yeah, but it's also through, evolved the amount of com- the amount of information you can consume. Well, so I mean, we, we can technically become much smarter because we're being able to download more. The, but every single generation has this situ this issue where. You know, we didn't grow up knowing how to survive in the wilderness. Like, I don't fucking know. I don't know how to start a fire on my own. I don't know how to find clean water or, you know, build a shelter by hand and all these things that we you used to You could sure shit Google and YouTube you, it, though. You yeah, can yeah. now. You can. Right. Yeah, you can now. You could have looked it up in a library before, too, but you're right. So it's just, I think every generation is scared for the younger generation, and every generation thinks that the younger generation is See, fucking See, I don't, up. because I think the, okay- the likelihood, right? And, and I'm sure that this rarely ever happens, but plane goes down in the fucking middle of nowhere, right? Like the likelihood now that somebody on that plane doesn't have a phone to fucking Google yourself to fucking safety compared to 20 years ago is yeah. like, I think you would have yeah, to hope to God skills. that somebody on there has those basic mm-hmm. skills where now you have these tools that you can rely well, on. Well, and is it better or worse? Well, I think, think it's, about it this way. Better, right? Think about it this way. One major, uh, you know, calamity that destroys our electronic systems like a massive solar flare emp or something yeah. it puts us puts us back in the stone age and we would see massive massive deaths Re- do in you a really, very short period do of time. you really think that would put us back to stone age you think it would be like all of a sudden we'd be walking around like idiots not knowing how to figure anything think out think about it this way there would be imagine a lot if of there would be chaos would, and, yeah. and pandemonium Ima- for sure imagine if no electronics worked at all like there's no electronics that worked at all. Right. Imagine what would happen. People wouldn't know how to get a hold of each other, where to go. It should be an exercise as a be, nation that we go through once a week. I mean, everything gets shut down. Yeah. Figure things out. For you know a week. what they do? It's not the create <laughs> community again, and people would talk to each other, and like somebody with skills would start teaching everybody, and like there would be order, uh, and you'd be connected to people again. Well, so I actually was having this conversation earlier um, with with Jessica, and we were talking about how. With media, even with internet, um, we're constantly being told what to think. We're told 
our emotions or the way we feel about things is molded so strongly by this sensationalized uh, thing that we call the media. Like I can look at the media and based off of that, I can believe that the world, like, that. oh my God, things are terrible. It's horrible. It's dangerous. It's scary. It's There's so much horrible things going on. If I shut all that off, just imagine this right now. If you shut all that off and just lived your life based on the people you ran into, you talk to people, whatever, you would think things were totally different. You would think like, oh, things are kind of cool. Like, you know, I didn't really see anything that horrible today for most people. And, you know, that guy was nice to me over there. And I don't really see these, you know, people getting kidnapped and all these horrible things happening. I don't see these wars. And and I, it's good to be informed, but I also think it's a good t- it's a good idea to fucking shut things off yeah. for a little while. Otherwise, you get this kind of distorted well, you take view. on everybody's stress. Like, it, 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 like... That, that I think that's a, an interesting problem we have now is that we know like too much of like problems like we know too many things going on all, all, like every second of the day there's a problem in the world. Well, and I mean, and we're drawn to that. Yeah. Like if if the media shows us all these good feel good stories, nobody wants to watch that because we're wired. It sucks. Our yeah, brains are wired. Awesome. Yeah. We're wired to be magnetized by bad information because we evolved in societies where that was important. Like in our tribe, if there was something bad going on, we need to know because it could, we want to solve problems because it could affect this right now versus the media is showing me something that's that, you know, happening in Oklahoma where this kid got kidnapped and it's terrible, whatever, but I feel like it's happening right here and it's going to affect me a particular way. And think about it this way. How many people feel terrible about their bodies and how they look and feel super self-conscious and it's based on media because if you walk around outside, everybody looks like that. Like most people look like that. Like right. I, I could walk around. Yeah. We could go we could go for a walk for miles just out here in San Jose and I bet you I could count on two fingers how many people I literally will see that would be really fit, if, if that. Well, no. I mean, I used to say this. Totally. I used to say this in my presentation at the gym. I used to stand people up in my presentation, like when I'd be in the sales pit, right? And I'd have them look stand up, right? To give them perspective of the, the goals that they want to achieve, right? And I'd say, look around the gym right now and find me five people that you want to look like physically. You know, there's not a lot. Most of these people- And that's a gym. Right, in a, exactly. And that was my point, was like, you're in the place where everybody gets fit, right? So these should be some of the fittest people around are going to be inside this gym, and you can't pick out five people that have the physique that you're aspiring to be. Now, why, why is that? Is it because everybody's lazy, nobody knows that? Or is it because we have distorted the the idea of what health and fitness and everything really looks like? Or what the average looks like. Well, yeah, right, exactly, or what the it's norm is. presented. Yeah, you know? now- can you look like a cover of a magazine? Absolutely, but we put on we put this uh, facade out that you know, hey, it, anybody can look this way, and like you, uh, this is all you have to do. And what do you what do you know that what this person has done to to uh, obtain this look for this moment for this photo shoot, and what they look like the rest of the year? It's just not Dude, what I'll, you think it is. I'll tell you what I you know I had horrible insecurities with my body, thinking I needed to build muscle, I need to look a particular way, and it was all distorted. Because I'd read all the bodybuilding magazines, I'd compare myself to all these particular individuals. The reality, even now, I'm 190 pounds, I'm six foot tall, I'm not a massive guy, but I'm usually one of the more muscular dudes in the room everywhere I go. I'm not a big dude. Mm. Now, if I base it off of what I see on Instagram, I'm fucking tiny. Right. I look terrible. I don't have like these crazy proportions. This is what people are going through, and it's distorted because we're so because our our, our concept of what normal is like if, if we turned all that off right now if, it, if all of it just shut off and we never looked at these pictures on Instagram or Facebook and none of the stuff and you just walked around every every day outside and just based it on what you see around you mm-hmm. you'd feel you probably feel a lot better because you'd have a more accurate depiction of what well I think that's people why the, like. the backlash for people that were photoshopping and all these types of things like people had such like a reaction to that because it's like they they have this assumption that like no like you wow like you really look this way and then like to 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 have them feel like they're fooled like that was such a that was such a, a mind opening thing for all these people like and it's like dude, of course you know if you're if you're in the mentality of presenting yourself as awesome all the time you know, I guarantee you, half the time, like some of these guys, they're they're just photoshopping. They're doing, these, you know, they, they want themselves to look the best and get the best angles all the time. Like it's not reality. It is, and and I know that there's an obesity epidemic. I understand that, uh, but 
even if you consider all that, even if you go back 50 years when there wasn't an obesity epidemic, how common do you think it was just walking around in everyday life that a man had a six pack? How common? Yeah. It, it, rare. Yeah. It's still, it's obviously super rare now. It was super rare before to the point where if, if you go to the beach and you have a six pack or you take your shirt off in public, people stare. That's how rare it really is. But yeah. you wouldn't think so, or at least your mind doesn't perceive it that way. When you open up your Instagram. Because right? that's all you look at. Yeah, I mean, I how many, how many women who've had children have stretch marks? A fucking lot of them do. How often do you see stretch marks on any pictures anywhere in the media? Oh yeah, never. So, so you get this like this false mental image that oh my god, I'm so I look so terrible because nobody looks this way, yeah. which is bullshit. Most people look that way. In fact, if you exercise at all, if you eat semi right at all, the truth is you probably look a lot better than most people. You're probably Fair in enough. the upper ten percent. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a I think that's a great. Uh, uh, guess as far as a number i think it's maybe even, maybe even smaller i mean i think you're probably five percent i think you're five percent i think uh when you get to the crazy level of like that competitive magazine look you're in the one percent of the one percent you know? and you know being in the fitness industry it amplifies it you know even more i have a lot of these conversations with my girlfriend she's a woman obviously and, and, and i think women deal with this even a little more just because they're advertised so heavily and, and this, which is true by the way media does advertise much more heavily to women, in, in particular when it comes to appearance because of clothes and all that stuff that they purchase more than men do. And my, my, you guys have seen my girl. She's very fit, very whatever. And she'll display these signs of being self-conscious. And I'm telling her, like, who looks at, who looks like you? Like, we'll be, we're will be we in Hawaii at the beach. Like, tell me one person that looks like you. But your mental image of that is yeah. so distorted. Yeah. And we're self-aware of it. And so consider people who aren't. And this is the that actually what worries me the most with social media with my kids is that uh, I know I grew up with the news and with TV and with magazines, and I know how much that distorted my image of things. Mm -hmm. Social media is so much faster. Things are posted so much quicker. There's yeah. so much variety. Like they're gonna, they're it's gonna just it's just exaggerating and compounding things. That we, we've dealt with this. It's not it's not new. It's that it's compounding, and mm -hmm. it's and the rate that it's compounding, and the the amount that the the younger generation is downloading it, right? As far as the information, and it's being put up. Well, in, and it's super influential. Well, yeah. when you when you look at the like the the book that I told you I read, the irresistible one, and they talk about like the average person, like how many times they pick their phone up. But like you pick your phone up now fifty something times a day, mm -hmm. and out of that fifty times, how many times is that checking Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat? That's like, media, media, right? media, media, commercial, 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 right. advertising, advertising. Advertisers, remember this right now. This is this is a fact. This is not uh, disputable. Media and advertisers' goal is to get you to think a particular way and feel a particular way. They are literally trying to manipulate you with tactics that get you to feel or think a particular way. Hopefully, to get you to either buy a product or to vote a particular way, or to act or behave in a particular way. So remember oh, that. That's the one I saw. Which one? I watched the one where they had the. He was like a cartoon guy, and he uh, uh, and he followed around a politician, and he manipulated the polls. But he was a comedian, and it was. Oh, a, I maybe didn't watch that. Oh, one. this is kind of cool. You'll you would like okay. this one. So the idea was that he uh, this guy was a really funny comedian, and they drove around in this truck that had a huge digital screen that played a virtual cartoon character. Oh yes, I that did was see this that one. was uh, mirroring what he was saying behind yeah. the behind the curtains basically, right? And so they would follow this politician around and call fuck with him. Fuck with him. Yeah, and just keep fucking calling him out and making fun of him and stuff and and it was distorting the polls big time because mm -hmm. he kept he just kept punking this guy. It well, that's a, that's it. They're all that's all their job hmm. is is to is to uh, manipulate you to get you to think that's what advertising is. That's what it does. It's very powerful if it wasn't it wouldn't be billion billion dollar you know billions of uh, dollars of, a, of an industry it's been around for a long time they've mastered it it's yeah. a science so you start when you're super young you think if you you think you're a self-aware smart individual uh if you watch media and commercials a lot you are going to be influenced it's a fucking fact i don't care how self-aware you think you are so it's a good idea to shut that shit off because they are literally telling you what to think and what to feel to the point where they can manipulate you so badly. You know, it's funny. We've got, I mean, we've got all this stuff going on with uh, with politics and you've got people thinking that 
uh, that the country is at the most racist it's ever been, for example. You're seeing this right now all over TV, right? And people being polled are like, oh my God, racism is at its absolute worst, which is false. It still exists, but it's false. It's way better than it's ever been. R- relations have been better than they've ever been, but the perception has been changed. Why? You got to ask yourself, why? What do people get out of making you feel a particular way? And it's to get you to vote or to act a particular way. And it's either with fear or to make you feel shitty or to or through sex or whatever. So it's a good idea to shut that shit off sometimes. I'll tell you something right now. Uh, stop flipping through Instagram so uh, incessantly or don't watch the news for a week. And I promise you'll feel better. Mm-hmm. You'll actually feel better about yourself. You can, I don't watch the news barely at all. Oh, man. I don't at all. Yeah. You can you can also challenge yourself by something that I continue to try and do, and I try and do it more and more as I get older. Is things that I feel most passionately about. I challenge my thought process on that. So if there's some, an opinion that I have that I feel strongly about it, um, those are the ones I'm seeking like to, to destroy my own opinion. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to do that. It's hard to say oh, I feel this way about this thing or this is what really makes me happy or this is what makes me really excited about something. Those those things, and I've talked about this before about analyzing my state change, like things throughout the day that make me extra happy, extra sad, you know, excited about things, things that change my state, and then then unpacking that and going, okay, why am I feel this way about this thing? And then, then on top of that, going, okay, instead of doing, because it's really easy to get into that, what we talked about, confirmation bias, where you're mm-hmm. continuing to search more things that just mm-hmm. confirm your own opinion already. How about instead of doing that, you know what, I feel so strong about this, so what if I read something that totally conflicts with that or read or watch something that is com- totally so important with- to do that because I mean even more so now right yeah because uh, I mean I, I feel like that's directly connected to empathy right so if, if you if you don't ever look at the other side of your stance then how are you how are you even going to be able to communicate with somebody um, you know, on the other side and come to understand them further. So well, not only that, I'm reading the book, reading this book, you talk about like these things like that, uh, the way we're advertising now. Yeah. I mean, the, everything that's popping up in your feed is the things that you're already, you're already liking. You're already confirming to the computer that you, oh, it's, it's taking you and isolating you. And yes. Smaller, it's, smaller. it's, it's, it's definitely starting to cattle you even more. So it's going to become more challenging to find those things. In fact, you're going to continue, you're going to continue to see stuff that already confirms what you were thinking, mm-hmm. which if you don't learn to teach, which I think, and they talk about this in the book, cause that's how you buy <clears throat> there's yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So there's going to become tools that help you disconnect from that and, and avoid that because they're doing such a good job of cattling you through Facebook and YouTube searches and Google searches that if you don't find ways to, wait a second, this is all I've been reading lately. This is all the information I've been consuming. I need to pull myself out of here and actually search the opposite of that and see what direction that takes all of this advertising, marketing, sidebar shit that Until I'm getting. Until they come pumped. up with an algorithm that will predict when you shift. <laughs> 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 then you're fucked. That would be tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's pick a day during the week where you kind of shut off or maybe you check your phone you know, in the morning for 15 minutes and then don't check it again until that night. They make apps for this. And just, and just go outside, just observe people around you, sit at a coffee shop, talk to people, talk to your neighbor. It's extremely fulfilling to do so, Mm -hmm. Um, and it it really does. It really makes you feel really, really good. Mm -hmm. Being stuck on these devices, uh, I've never. I mean, I end up feeling worse. Right. And I think everybody uh, can can kind of relate to what I'm saying. Inherently, you feel disconnect, right? And I think that's why a lot of times people feel lonely and they feel like depressed a little bit. It's it's just like. They haven't like necessarily realized that maybe they haven't had those interactions. Maybe that hasn't been a part of their daily routine anymore. You haven't looked somebody in the eye and had a conversation with them. That does something to you, you know. Mm-hmm. That, that that gives you something, mm-hmm. and it's important. Yeah, I mean, uh, anxiety. I think is now the number one diagnosed um, psychiatric uh, issue in America. Is anxiety. So it's, it's, in, exploding. it's inevitable that we're going this way. It's inevitable that it's going to get worse because yeah. not everybody's a mind bump listener. Not everybody, <laughs> can, not everybody gives a shit about that it going that direction. So what fascinates me is the types of businesses that will evolve because of it. Oh, totally. It's just like, like training, dude. I mean, it, like we look at this as like there's potential problems, right? Because everything's accelerating. It's so fast and like we're losing connectivity with everybody. Like so connectivity, it's just like how do I 
place this like I have to like literally try and focus on this as being a part of my life while everything else is telling me otherwise. Right. Yeah. I saw one of the one of the parts inside the the White Christmas one I thought was really cool was and I believe for sure this will be a a business is the business that he had created that was kind of illegal, the one where he Oh, would, he helps him date. Yeah, where he helps yeah. cuz you know, you think about what we're talking about that the more um you know, or the less interaction that you have with one-on-ones face to face and you're, and then when you actually have to do that for personal relations or meeting the your significant other, whatever, uh, how important that will become to have these social skills. And it, it, quite frankly, oh, you'll you, stand out. Yeah, right. And 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 you're not going to. Most people are not going to. This generation coming up are so wired to their phone and connected totally. that they're going to miss this. So that's going to create an opportunity for somebody older, wiser to see that to be able to help that. You're going to be the guy with the six pack. Right. Yeah. You're, you're going to be the person who is who's in their ear teaching them how to communicate and talk and making money off it. And then I found it fascinating that they took it a step further and said, not only will that become a business, but then the, the people will pay to watch that service. Oh my God. Right. So that's the spinoff of it. Right. So the dude's got, he's in his ear. You're watching firsthand, like through their eyes, like him yeah. coaching him through, like b- getting ready to bang this girl out. Meanwhile, he's got a, a forum of maybe oh my God. He's a little earpiece. Yes. And like, oh my God. And 20 people are paying to watch this live, this guy get laid and wow. be coached on how to get laid. So they're paying probably top dollar to get this firsthand. Well, let's talk to Jordan from Art of Charm. There's a <laughs> business opportunity there. <laughs> I should share that. I wonder, yeah. I wonder if he watches that show. He'll he'll appreciate that yeah, for what that's he does. Awesome. Sure. It, and it's always it's always great when you meet people and you shake their hand and you say something nice to them and you talk to them. It seems like today more than ever, the more they're like shocked by it. Have you guys mm. experienced this? We're mm-hmm. like, wow, you're really a nice guy. And you're like, I am. <laughs> if you don't get that every day, like people are not like that. Like you looked at me yeah. and you shake my hand. Wow. Oh, it's, it's crazy. I, yeah. I'm looking forward to when we get to the point in the future with tech that will actually be able to like read like our deficiencies and stuff that are in our body, like where we're missing like micronutrients or like how I'm supplementing with, with sure. vitamin D or how oh, I'm yeah. the, the knowledge aspect of it is amazing. Oh, like, it's, could it's you, a, could it you imagine, could you imagine of waking up in the morning and being like, whoop, the screen comes up in front of my face says, Adam, you're lacking in D3. Oh, See totally. this and all yeah, this like yeah. that. And then those are yeah. the exact, I take my Organifi, green, green, my green juice followed oh, by shit. this. And then I got the exact stuff that I need to take before I start my day. And then, oh, the next day, like, great job. You've got yeah. right on point on yeah. all your totals that you know. Amazon comes and gives you pills, you know. Right, like, right, right. It knows that I'm almost <laughs> out. Drones you outside. have three days left yeah. of your Organifi juice. All of that <laughs> thing gets shipped over to my house. Oh my like, God. I mean, so there's to me, there's a lot of things. Well, that there's I, a huge, there's huge benefits as well. Huge benefits. There's just anytime we have something that's very powerful, it uh, and uh, man, humans are just like this. It can go good or it can go bad, and it's up to us to choose totally. which direction we go. And unfortunately. When something new is introduced, we usually go real bad before we real go real bad, and then we start, we start cleaning to, up. Start yeah, to clean up. But totally. uh, have you been mixing the green and the red? By the way, the the, the Organifi Whoa. green and yeah, the Organifi Christmas red? action. Huh? Well, the Christmas yeah, mix. Yeah, no, you you told me that. I think that because I asked you, I said, is there anything that's compounds that are conflicting? Right, I don't want to have like fucking energy, and the other ones like put me to sleep and relax. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, no, 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 no everything's uh, they they complement each other. And the, uh, so I take them together, right? Uh, and the the flavor is awesome that way. So I mix the red. And the uh, green, which, by the way, you fuckers, I don't know who took the other. There's like no more red. Me. We've gone through so many of the red already. I don't Is know. Is that you, mm-hmm. Justin? I mean, I took one of them. Did I we get more? Did we get more order. of the green juice than we got the red? Because I feel like okay, we did, Doug. Yeah. So we did. Yeah. So I was like, this doesn't make sense. I don't. Are feel- you using it before your workouts and stuff? Or yeah, sometimes I'll have it in the morning. Like I, so on, during the cruise, I was having it every morning. Um, just it, it became like breakfast for me. I was I was having that stuff. There's 25 calories in each, so you get about you know 45 or 50 calories. Uh, in there and it actually was holding me over until I had a meal later on in the afternoon so I was doing that uh, during the cruise because I know I wasn't moving a lot mm. Uh, but if on a normal day, like today where I'll have breakfast and everything, I will have it like maybe a half hour before I go to the gym mm-hmm. and work out. Now, and Justin's then, been using the probiotic. I have. Cause yeah. you asked me about that. Mm-hmm. Have you, were you using a probiotic before or is this your first time? No, really I using just, one consistently? yeah, I've been using it consistently. This is the first time. And, um, it really noticeably helped when I, especially on vacation when I was eating like out more more consistently um and so I, I made sure to like stay consistent with the, with the probiotics and that what really is it help helping with are you getting uh, better with your heartburn a little bit better with the heartburn and just you know my sometimes like my gut doesn't feel too good like mm. um you know w- when i'm traveling primarily so but yeah at, at home and my continual use of it um between 
between that, I mean, there's a couple different factors. It could be that. It could be that, you know, I've, I've um, timed my food. Uh, so I'm a little bit more in the middle of the day now instead of the end of my day. And I'm also like um, cutting out certain types of um, peppers that I've found. What do you mean by that? You're, you're at the beginning of the day, middle of the day. What are you talking about? What so you- I used to eat like more like at eight o'clock or something like that for dinner. Oh, okay. So I've, I've shifted that more at like six. Oh, because then when you lay down to go to bed. Yeah. Or whatever. And it like, and, mm. I, and it, like I knew that, but like for me, I just don't like to eat breakfast. And so like, I, I tend to skip that. And then, you know, the way that we work throughout the week, yeah. like I can't eat like lunch until at least two or three o'clock typically. Um, so what I've done is, um, I'll, I'll eat a smaller lunch and, or I'm sorry, I'll eat a bigger lunch and then I'll eat a smaller dinner kind of at six o'clock. So I, I tell you what, one of the best things that I ever started to do, and I don't remember what it was. Well, actually, I do remember. I remember I was having a cheeseburger. I was eating a, che- <laughs> I was eating a five guys burger. <laughs> this is going to be a good story. I was eating a five guys burger with Katrina and it was late at night and we were fucking Netflixing and chilling. Right. And we're sitting there in bed and I'm, and I'm actually eating this burger and I remember just being like, oh my God, it felt like a rock was was sitting in my chest. Like it didn't even make it, didn't even feel like it made it all the way down. I'm like, oh, I remember having, st- I stood up and like kind of walked around in the room. I'm like burping and I just felt awful. And I, I told Katrina, I'm like, man, I cannot do that anymore. That's something as a kid that never bothered me. I could lay in bed and eat food and do whatever. Mm-hmm. And I it never, I never really noticed anything like that before. Or all of a sudden I, I started to pick up on this, like, whoa, if I, you know, eat and I'm laying down or I'm pretty sedentary, I really can feel the difference. And so it's a, it's a, a ritual for her and I that walking right after. Meals. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's our, difference. I've been doing that too. Yeah. That's I've, our late night thing. We, totally. we eat dinner and then we typically walk the boys before we go to bed. And I, man, it, I oh. can, I literally swear to God, I could, I could feel it digesting. I mean, it really makes me feel that so, much better. So when you move, first of all, gravity assist right. in digestion. So you're standing but then walking, there are muscles like the psoas, for example, which is surrounded or on or around your digestive organs that actually helps massage food down. Movement does definitely do that. So eating and then just sitting is not is probably not the best yeah, thing to not, do. It's not the move. You, uh, have you guys taken or tried using the turmeric, the Organifi turmeric? I haven't actually. Okay, so turmeric is... Anti-inflammatory, I know that. Anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer... Uh, it boosts. Uh, I read a study about it boosting brain-derived neurotropic factor. I like to cook with turmeric as much as possible because of its health benefits. But if mm. I don't, then now that we have the how do you use it uh, w- when you're cooking? Oh, f- chicken, rice, like curries, you stuff just like put that. Put it in there, like yeah. as a spice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's really, really, especially goes good with coconut. Okay. So like coconut uh, creams or whatever. I'll try that. Yeah, it's really fucking good. But it's got um, a lot of health benefits. It, it's considered now a superfood. There's a lot of study going into turmeric for its effect on, especially arthritis patients. Are showing a benefit with uh, supplementing with curcumin, which is the one of the active compounds mm-hmm. in turmeric. Um, it boosts brain-derived neurotropic factor in the brain, so that's something that uh, your brain really thrives thrives off of. Uh, so it, it theoretically, could improve cognitive function. I've, all, like I said, for the last four years, I've really tried to include it in a lot of my dishes. But now that we have the sponsorship, I've been I've just been taking turmeric, and I'll take it with a meal that's got fat in it because it helps uh, your body absorb it or utilize it more but i'd like to since you guys don't ever use it or, or really haven't i'd like to get your guys's take on supplementing on it on a, sure. on a daily basis well everett cooks with it a lot so oh okay yeah he cook. so i do get it in food um quite often so uh what's your what's your idea though on like the rda on it like how much of it do i need to be taking that's if, a great if I'm, if I'm already intermittently getting it like what's your uh, thoughts on that's that? a great question so um i don't know i know studies We'll use a regular daily dose of it, um, and so that's how I'm using it now. Just because we have, like I said, we have the sponsorship, so we've got the the, the capsules, and I could just take four of them mm-hmm. um, every single day, and I'll take them with dinner. Um, but some cultures eat, eat it all the time, like Indian cultures eat quite a bit of it um, in their cooking. So I would I would say, especially if you have inflammatory issues or if you have gut issues, because it's really good for gut health. Um, I would use it on a daily basis. Because it's a food, and not and or like a you know like a plant, not a supplement in the sense that it's not an extract or whatever, you could probably use it every day. Now, uh, do you do you think that it has um, countering effects if I actually took it with like a, a food that was a food that was like pro-inflammatory, 
And and would that help negate that because I took it together with that? Or? That's a great question. Because re- I know, and I've talked about this before with the the way the cell absorbs um, uh, omega threes. Yeah, threes and nines. That the nines are more dominant and more com- and more competitive. So if you overconsume the nines, that doesn't even matter if I take in the threes because they they basically push the the threes out of the yeah. cell. So that's a good question. I don't like or, uh, not allow. Them. I don't even like speculating on that because then what people will do is they'll eat like a shitty meal and they'll be like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna take this. Yeah. Turmeric now to offset Try to that. cancel it out. I yeah. don't think it works that way. No. It's not a. It's not a, a. It's not a pharmaceutical with this. That's why I wanted to ask you because I think that's important for people to understand that because you, again, why Mind Pub has always stood by like you know save your money on the supplements that you know you gotta you gotta have the diet right first before you take some of these things. Otherwise, great it's just question. Got a canceling. Out great effect. point. I, I I don't know how much benefit it'll give you if you have a shitty diet and you don't exercise. I think. It's a part of a healthy diet. I again, mm. ideally, this is what you would do. You would either put make a smoothie and take some turmeric root and throw it in there. It'll be it'll it'll be kind of strong tasting. Mm-hmm. That or get and cook with it on a regular basis, or just supplement with it. One of the more fascinating things about turmeric is it's also being studied for its effect on depression. And uh, the theory is is because of its effect on inflammation. That it may benefit people with depression because it's we're starting to show now that depression is strongly linked to inflammation, which could be connected to your gut health and all that other stuff. But reducing inflammation is being shown to help people with depression, and turmeric is one of those things. So nice. it's a yeah, pretty fascinating stuff. Bird. Is being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. Quad. First up is Carter's Consumptions. What do you guys think is an optimal caffeine intake? How much is too much? Are there any benefits to caffeine? Yes, yes, and Ten yes. espresso shots. Yes, yeah. yes, and yes. Yeah. Caffeine is a very interesting stimulant chemical found in nature uh, that humans have been consuming for a very, very long time. And it's interesting because- The well, shitty part is it's very individualized, right? I mean, it, each person is going to be it's different levels uh, oh, of- Oh, there's, yeah. there's a huge, just like with everything, right? But uh-huh. caffeine- has got some huge uh, uh, variants from individual to individual. There is, and I had to look this up because I don't know the name of it, uh, but caffeine is mainly metabolized by the liver, and, it, and there's an enzyme that is used to metabolize it, and I wrote it down here. It's called CYP1A2, but the ability to produce this enzyme is regulated- Sounds like a robot. Is regulated by a particular gene. So if you have changes in this DNA sequence of this gene- then it, that'll determine how efficiently you can metabolize caffeine and eliminate it from the body. So some people genetically produce very little of this enzyme while others produce a large amount. That right there will play a, a large role in how tolerant you are to caffeine. So what may be great and effective and healthy for one person may be too much uh, for another individual. So this is very important to know because I'm about to read off all the health benefits of caffeine. Yeah, let's let's read off the signs and symptoms that you should pay attention well, to. Uh, well, well, I'm first let me I'll go into like with the health benefits, but I'm one of the people that is very sensitive to caffeine. So, if I didn't uh, You're a pussy too. Yeah, if, though, I, so. yeah, <laughs> if I didn't pay attention to this and I just saw the benefits and I may continue to push caffeine and continue to get negative side effects in which case caffeine's not good for me. Yeah. So, it's it's an important thing to note. So, I actually uh, looked up all of the studies that... So these are all the proven benefits of uh, caffeine. First off, uh, consumption of caffeine um, reduces the instance of mouth, throat cancer, and liver cancer by a tremendous amount. Yes. Yeah, coffee in particular, but caffeine as well. Um, caffeine re- reduces risk of stroke. Uh, it uh, reduces the risk of type 2 um, diabetes. Um, reduces chronic inflammation. Inflammation. Um, it helps people with asthma. Now, which I let, me, let me back up real quick mm-hmm. here because I want to. When we read things like this, 
So when it says something like can reduce uh, diabetes, <laughs> now I know you're going. Now is Not that Starbucks? Is that is that because I can show that you know studies show that people that take in caffeine then move more, then in turn burn more calories, then in turn can help prevent them from getting diabetes is that the th- thought process well, behind this black when, coffee this isn't like you know with two pumps of caramel i just want no of course no. i just okay. want to I, I just want to help people understand that when 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 i see stuff like this that's kind of how my brain works because I, I, it's not like there's this direct thing that helps prevent diabetes because you drink coffee every morning no it, so mm. ca- caffeine in particular um increases insulin sen- sensitivity in the body so because it increases insulin sensitivity Theoretically, it reduces uh, risk of diabetes, and studies done specifically on diabetes do show that caffeine consumption does re- reduce the risk of, of diabetes. So, it's—I don't know if it's super conclusive that that is the only factor that's doing it, but it's pretty—it's um, it's pretty—it's pretty well it's, established. It's the—it's the the reason why I say that it's the same way that someone can can put caffeine or something inside of a fat burner, and then you yeah. can call it a fat burner because. You can say that because you're on caffeine, it then speeds the heart rate up. It then makes you move more. In turn, you burn more calories. Therefore, I can now say that it can help burn fat. Well, in terms of fat burning, there's a few things that caffeine may benefit uh, in in that particular sense. One is, yes, like Adam's saying, you're more energetic. You may want to move more. Um, It increases the, the release of catecholamines, which are fat burning chemicals. Um, it does increase or improve insulin sensitivity um, in the body, and it increases fat mobilization on its own. So those three things uh, show that it can help you with obesity and all those other things. However, this is now here. Here comes the the caveats. You build a tolerance to caffeine pretty quickly, so all those those potential fat burning effects you re- they reduce dramatically over time. Caffeine tolerance is very quick. We build it very fast. Yeah. You take someone who's never had caffeine. You give them a little bit and they're fucking hyper and they feel amazing. Give it to them every single day within a week or two. Already starting to get used to yeah. it. Right, I get it. I build up a tolerance within days. I know when I drink one and I start getting sleepy. That's that's bad. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you know. Oh, when well, you're taking, you actually get tired. Yeah, like sometimes, I, like I'm like, okay, I need to totally back off and start over again. I'm actually at that point right now. I'm at yeah. a point where I know, not that I'm getting sleepy, but I know that it's it's been a while since I've totally cut out my caffeine. And I and I haven't done that, and I'm due for that. I did the marijuana one not too long ago, so then I I kind of cycle. Like there's all these things that I find that I do a lot that have got lots of benefits to them, and I'm pro pro caffeine, I'm pro marijuana, but I also recognize that both those things really quick you can build a tolerance up to, and then before you know it, you're having to intake a ton of it just to feel that. Well, I think I think that's the real truth behind this, and that because yeah. we can't give like a milligram dosage per person because mm-hmm. every you know. Someone like Sal, who's sensitive to it, can take in 25 milligrams, and he's like flying. Where someone like Justin probably has to take 200 milligrams just to feel the same oh, effect. No, no, he, you That's know, like way my more. Normal. Yeah. No, right. way more. Like I, I take 100 milligrams, or 200 for me is I'm fucking on fire. 100 is good. <laughs> Justin or even Adam, I've seen you guys consume 500, 600 in a sitting, no mm, problem. Totally. By the size of the coffees that you're drinking, if I had 500 milligrams of caffeine at one time. No joke, I would be, be a sick. Lot of fun. No, I wouldn't. I'd be sick. <laughs> I, no, I would probably get sick or be like I, really. I would get probably get jittering, yeah, I would either, sweating. I would either get nauseous or sick, or I'd I'd probably have I'd have to go to the hospital. I get I would get that. I, get, I when I used to overdo it when I was younger, my hands mm. the tremors. Yeah. <laughs> well, more people are hospitalized for overconsumption of caffeine than almost anything else in terms of like things that will consume. Mm. It's actually quite common. Here's the other thing too: if you're in a chronically stressed state. And you're suffering from the symptoms of, you know, a, you know, HPA axis type issues like cortisol resistance or what some people will call adrenal fatigue. The last thing you should do is have a ton of caffeine. So here, that's something else you want to consider. Like if you're this really stressed out individual and you're having issues with sleep and you feel kind of shitty or whatever, uh, stay away from caffeine because that's only going to make things worse. That's going to make yeah. cortisol levels higher you just start working on dampening it down yeah, absolutely yeah. and like on your point adam when it comes to you know building a tolerance of things what you want to understand is there's at a particular dose there's benefits at more of a dose you don't get more benefits you just get more side effects and when you build up a tolerance when you build up a tolerance what ends up happening is you need to take more 
to feel the same benefits. Do you know this? But is, now the risk for side effects. This are is higher. this is kind of a, a piggybacking off the topic that we just did that a lot of people have been sharing was the Rich Piana discussion about steroids mm. and stuff, and we talk about that steroids by themselves and the use of it. There's studies that show the health benefits and how it can be totally safe and fine. But what ends up happening because you build a tolerance for that too. You know, you can see, and I, I, being somebody who's who's done hormone therapy for a long time, I know that when I can tell when my body is not responding the same way from from a dosage, and it's like I have two choices: either one, that's when I should wing off and come off of it for a while, and then reintroduce, or two, yeah, I have to increase. Which I told told you guys before, my body already tells rejects it after I get to a certain point. I already feel the adverse. I can see and feel these signs start coming up. If I start pushing up to the mm-hmm. 400, 500 milligram range, which some of these guys, that's a stream. That's, that's being off, you know, for some of these guys yeah. that are So when you think about, you know, we're talking about caffeine and I'm comparing to steroids and I know they're completely opposite, but the idea of how this could lead to something that could be totally fine and safe and not dangerous to something that could actually have some adverse effects or even become potentially dangerous mm-hmm. for somebody. Think about it this way. It's like, if I, um, have a high performance vehicle and I just hammer gasoline in there and the and the car tries to adapt by sh- shrinking the tube that injects the engine with gasoline so that I'm taking in less and less even though I'm adding more and more gasoline. Mm. So eventually I'm adding so much gasoline it weighs the car down, it's spilling out of the freaking gas tank, I'm getting all these side effects. When you're taking these substances, it's not just the amount of the substance that needs to be considered. It's also your ability to assimilate it and use it. Mm. And that includes receptor sites that are open for it. So, you know, 100 milligrams of caffeine may affect you in- amazingly because you've got all these wonderful ac- receptors that are open to it. Once those receptors start to downregulate, mm-hmm. I have to take more and more caffeine to get the same effect. But now, because I have so much more caffeine, the side effects start to go up. So now, instead of getting energy and feeling great and motivated from caffeine, I just, it makes me feel normal at best, or at worst, I feel shitty, irritable, shaky, anxiety, those types of things. So if you like the effects of, of, of substances like caffeine and you love the way it makes you feel, one of the best things you could do is give yourself a schedule. Like literally say, I will allow myself no more than X amount of yeah. coffee mm-hmm. per day. And on these days, I don't have any at all. I like to do that. I like to not have caffeine on days that I don't have much to do, I'm going to relax, then why have it? And, and it's going to cut it off, yeah, just, at some just, point in your day so you can start the process so of ramping it I, down. I do something similar. So mine is the, the two cups of coffee. So if I start finding myself wanting more than two cups of coffee, that's my sign I need to go back the other direction. Because I have my, my morning ritual, I pour a cup, just regular coffee, not Starbucks, just a little mug, you know, from heat, when I drive from work to here. And then normally I either mm-hmm. pour a cup from our our tap first cup doesn't count that's what i would say so and then the the second one is that if i find myself reaching for it again mid-afternoon or another time through the day or you know like you said where we've slammed 500 600 and having a huge venti one or that that is my sign that okay it's time for me to come back the other direction which is where i'm at right now right now i'm at this two cups of coffee and i don't feel like i'm really getting anything from it where the next step for me is to have a third cup of coffee where i'm like okay now i'll come back the other way and then you just get you just get more side effects and when you when you manage it that way like when i'm managing things properly a small amount of, you know, Chimera coffee or 100 milligrams of caffeine in a caffeine pill or whatever, man, I feel fucking great. I'm motivated, energized, creative. I, I have, I can have good workouts. Everything's fantastic. If I bump it up to the point where I'm going 200, 250 milligrams, I get, I have way less benefit and effects from it and more, way more side effects. So it's also just just milking out the benefits of it. And this is true for almost anything, but especially for caffeine. But again, there is a big variance. Find what your sweet spot is where you feel great and you don't feel any negatives and try to play with staying around that, which means you're probably going to have to reduce it at least a couple days a week 
to maintain that effect. Quick commercial break, you guys. We keep getting asked all the time, how can I support the Mind Pump family? Here's one of the best ways you guys can. You guys love that Chimera Coffee that we have. Chimera Coffee with a K. You go to ChimeraCoffee.com, put in the discount code Mind Pump for 10% at the checkout. If you guys have not tried Ben Greenfield's new bars out, they're fantastic. If you want some, go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com forward slash Nature Bite. Put in the code Mind Pump and get 10% off. Go check it out. Christian9688. Do you think we don't use our brains to their full capacity because we lose connection to muscles like the ones in our feet? Ooh. For sure. Ooh. 100%. Yeah. Yes. For 100%. Sure. A, a big part of your brain um, is uh, devoted to uh, your senses touch, movement, sight, smell, all these different things. Your brain develops, uh, you know, connections, uh, you know, neurological connections to these types of things. Avoiding them or not using them means that your brain is probably not going to op- op- uh, operate in an optimal way. You see this with music. You know, we've cut music from schools for a long time now because we don't think it's important like math and science, right? Because, well, music, who gives a shit? You're not going to make money doing music. Mm. But now we have conclusive studies that show when children learn music, they do better math, science, and yeah, writing. Right. Same thing is true with movement. If you lose the development, because your brain will, it will lose just like anything. It if prioritizes. You, yes. And if you stop doing something, your brain loses its ability. We were literally talking about this last night. Katrina was making a comment because we uh, just getting back from our trip, uh, finished up the books uh, that we were reading. We are uh, about to pick the book that we're going to go through next. And uh, we were just talking about this, the whole process of us staying on that. And we we're just kind of like, you know, I'm glad we've been consistent with that, with everything that we've had going on and this and that. And she was like, she's like, I can tell a difference in you when you're reading and when you're not. And she's like, just your your creativity and your ideas with your business, the way you think. And she mm-hmm. goes, I can, she goes, being an outsider and paying attention to you, I always know when you're really reading a lot and then when you're kind of not. And it's just like, you're still a great person both ways. She goes, but I can- It dif- shows up in your conversation it, and, and it, all that. And so, and really, you're exercising a part of the brain, right? In a sense, right? So when, we, when we're comparing it to a muscle, you're, you're ex- exercising a pathway here, mm-hmm. right? And that's what, when you exercise, there's a, a, a neurological connection from the brain to the fingers, like Sal was saying. So if I wiggle my fingers, there's a neurological connection from the brain to there that are telling those muscles to wiggle and move, you stop doing that, it becomes harder to do that. Same thing goes for exercising the brain with thinking processes right. through mathematical equations, through creativity, through all these these different pathways in your brain that that tap into this. If you don't exercise it, you don't stretch it, you don't train it, you will lose it and it will start to diminish. So I, I wanted to pose a question. Like, So you know about uh, neuroplasticity and you know about the lawsuit that, that one company got that was like promoting brain games and that mm. it was it was supposed to... They talked about this in the book. Okay. That that's actually not true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious about that and what the lawsuit entailed and, and what- That's the, why. Yeah. They the, talked the about this in the book. I they think beca- the claims were that it was going to make your brain work better by exercising it with right. these particular games yeah. and stuff like that. The reality is- it didn't what, have carryover. No, and, but the, yeah, and the reality is what's, what's best for your brain is a very sensory rich environment. Hmm. So an environment that includes- Touch, movement, sight, sound, uh, and being able to process all these things in different ways. And it also means- All different stimulus. Different stimulus. And it also means sometimes shutting off other things. Mm. It's like going in a quiet room or whatever to Mm -hmm. focus on other- uh, you know, parts of your of your mind. And so your it brain. operates completely differently. It, it, yes, and those are the things that develop a brain that operates uh, and functions in an optimal way. We again, movement. Let's look at exercise for uh, for example. That has been removed from schools now for a while because again, we think it's not important. But we now know for a fact that movement and exercise has a direct relationship with how well you think and process and your IQ. They will they will actually show that when people exercise. Regularly, they will have a raise or a boost in IQ. Yep. And you can experience this instantly, instantly, literally. If you're sitting there and you feel like you have brain fog and you're tired, get up out of your chair, go for a walk outside, do some push-ups, do a trigger session, whatever. I guarantee you within 10 to 15 minutes, you're going to be sharper. Mm-hmm. You're going to think a lot better. It's just an absolute fact. These parts, look at our feet. You know, In the question, they brought up the feet. Um, 
your feet, uh, of all your body, you have your hands, your feet, I think your lips, your nipples, your genitals. There's certain parts of the body that are super, super, super rich. My nipples. In, ner- <laughs> in nerve endings. They're super rich in nerve endings. One of these parts of our body we cover since, since, since we're children and almost always keep it covered all the time and don't ever touch them to anything, and that's our feet. We're always in shoes all the time. That part of our brain is so fucking undeveloped that uh, I, it will really shock you to take your shoes and socks off and just walk around barefoot most of the time when you can and notice the difference. Notice the difference in how you feel just from doing that. Mm-hmm. It's something that we totally neglect. In fact, these areas are considered erogenous zones because they're, they're, they're so rich in nerve endings to the point where uh, you know, with our feet, you know, we're so ticklish on the bottom of our feet Mainly because I don't think we can process the sensations on our feet because they're always so covered. So it's a ticklish thing to us. Like, oh my God, don't mm. touch my feet. I the only reason why that's the case is because they're always covered. By the time you uncover yeah. them, it's like they're, you're, you can't process all this crazy yeah, you know, don't sensory. Touch my feet. It's like the sensory I'll overload. kill you. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? No, totally. it's true. And, you, and this, so they've done this with studies with people who've had um, cochlear implants in their, in their ears where they were deaf for a long time or even as children, then they'll put this implant and they can hear for the first time. It's too much. Overload, right? You have to be careful Mm. because it takes a second for the brain to be able to process and all the sensory. Otherwise, it becomes overwhelming. The sound becomes just too much. To to piggyback off that too, what happens, what what always happens with somebody who is missing one of those, right? Like let's say you're blind or you can't hear, the other ones are heightened, Mm -hmm. right? So you have to, now the brain is prioritizing more over there, which just tells you that the, the, the ability, there's so much more room for us to enhance all these areas if the focus and the training or the, uh, you know, you, you start to put, uh, I don't even know what the word I'm looking for more here. More emphasis. Yeah, more emphasis on it, on that, whatever that, that strength is or that pattern or that pathway is in your brain. And it's fascinating to me to see that when you have somebody who is either deaf or blind or has something that they're they're lacking, normally the other senses are way beyond the average person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're, you're, honestly, your, your best bet for a good, healthy brain includes, for sure includes movement. Uh, it's very, very important for you to move and feel and touch things. You know, the Soviet Union did some horrible, horrible studies, but they were uh, they were very fascinating, but they did them on children where, where babies were orphaned or whatever or, or you know, put up for adoption as soon as birth. And they did these studies where they took babies that they 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 fed them and, you know, kept them warm and all that stuff, but they weren't allowed to be touched. So the nurses, so the, nev- the nurses never went in there and held them and caressed them. They just fed them, put them back in there, and then they had a g- other group of children. And then of they babies. became Putin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They got. Uh, they were sick. They were sickly. They had uh, issues with, I mean, mental issues, like all because they weren't getting touched or felt. Well, and that's a very extreme case of what can happen. But if you neglect movement with your body. Um, in any particular way, you're just not reaching your optimal potential. And it doesn't mean you have to be this super athlete or anything like that. Just realize its importance. And music is one of those things. Movement is one of those things. Touch is one of those things. Um, you know, communication is one of those things. Reading, math, all these things is provides this rich environment for your brain to really develop to its full uh, capacity. Yeah. Have you have you guys seen that uh, documentary Icarus? No. Well, okay. It, it it goes over like the Soviet involvement with like, um, you know, like PEDs and all that, like how they've been um, sneaking past all the, um, the ways that they test for it. And uh, they got one of the, one of the main scientists there in the lab, like they, they got him to kind of come forward and. um, Oh, is this, he's the cyclist? Yes. Oh, I want to watch this. It was very, very fascinating. Like how they were able to get beyond all these like really, really strict um, wait, Icarus? protocols it's called Icarus. Uh-huh. Dude, didn't he get? It's did, on Netflix. Wasn't he getting yeah. in like trouble for it or something? Yeah, or, like, he, he was, had to go into witness protection because because he was giving away. all Yeah, because I mean, it literally went back to like the beginning of the Olympics. Like they've been doing it since like way back. Well, they they talked about that in state sponsored. Uh, man. State sponsored. Yeah, bigger, stronger, faster. They touched on. I think I think it was bigger, stronger, faster. That touched on that a little bit. How. I mean, that's how we were getting our asses handed to us back back then. They were just pounding us because we, they were able to fool all the tests and everybody. And then, then, then all of a sudden, 
that's where the U.S. finally got on board. Like, oh, okay, so the name of the game, is, yeah. So here's how you do it: is yeah. to you know, uh, is to get your athletes to take the stuff, but then to find ways to cheat the test. Well, so. what do you think? Why do you think when this, the totally. Soviet Union collapsed and a lot of their coaches came here, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we're doing awesome. <laughs> all of our performances are fucking <laughs> going through the roof. Didn't he? Didn't Man. he take them all? So he was natural, right? And then they gave oh. him all these drugs. So it started out as being like about the cyclist and like him experimenting and, and kind of going through that process. See how much it can improve. Yeah, see how it can improve. And like he kind of through the process realized that it didn't, it wasn't going to make him like even in the top 10. Like he, he got really like bummed out. Like he actually performed worse uh, the the following race after being on PEDs for that year. So oh, wow. uh, it, it went kind of beyond that story. And then it got more into like he connected to this scientist who um, was kind of like getting all his urine and getting all the samples and, you know, kind of like like telling him the protocol of what he needs to do uh, to get, you know, beyond these tests and all that kind of stuff. And then it turned into him and his story of how he'd been getting beyond all these things because it was state mandated and like how, you know, the KGB was involved and all this stuff. It's, it's crazy. That's insane. Yeah. Next up is Godzilla 1112. What do you think of the sled? Where does it fit into one's workout? Oh, that's your I, I love favorite. the sled. Love the sled. Yeah, I like it mainly because, like, uh, especially with clients that maybe maybe they have uh, a bit of of biomechanic issues or things that, like, you know, you want to address in the squat, but you still want them to, you know, to get good conditioning, good strength work, you know, that kind of stuff, like. Um, it's really, really low impact. It's a really low impact exercise that, um, you know, is a great, a great one to kind of throw into the mix. I have seen, uh, I saw huge gains from adding the sled into my routine. It, it be, has become a staple, uh, in almost all of my leg training. Like I just absolutely, and I do some back stuff with it, but I love to pull and drag, push the sled yeah, uh, I've done it um, before my workouts, in the middle of my workouts, after my workouts. There's lots of ways that you can use it, and it's in arguably one of the most functional things that you can do because in real life, like getting getting strong in, in pushing something or pulling something is really more likely that you're going to use it's that primal, yeah, that skill opposed to. You know, when are you ever going to put a load load something on the back of your traps and squat down as much as much as especially the, for a bunch of reps, right? Yeah, and that's not gonna happen. Exactly, and we talk about and the squat is the king of all exercises. But when you even when you talk about and 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 one of the most functional things you do, and I'm not debating that here, but you know, the sled sled pulling and pushing is right up there, and the the amount of muscle that you can build, the pumps that you can get from it. Are in it's a different stimulus. Oh and man, it's insane. They complement each other so well. You know, it really like sort of fulfills like the need, um, you know, of your muscles. Like, so it's not just like this this very specific contraction where I'm like squatting down into depth and coming up and getting you know my hips involved. This is like I'm driving. I'm constantly pumping you know blood in, into my legs, and it's it's pretty gnarly. I also like to use it as a uh, increasing my volume and frequency. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm putting like a lot of emphasis on, you know, growing my legs right now, you know, I'm training my legs two to three times in the week. And then on top of that, once or twice during maybe a chest or shoulder type of workout, I'm going to go over and drag or push the sled for four or five rounds and get this great pump. So you get, I get the benefits from the, and, and I'll, the weight I'll choose according to how my legs feel. Like if I've already got a lot of damage and I'm trying to recover, I'm going to do a lighter weight. I'm going to push the sled working on my mechanics and just get some blood flow there, get some calories burned. If I, my legs feel great and recovered, I might stack some more weight on there yeah. and push it a few times. So yeah, well, the, rant. go ahead. Well, so. I was going to say one of the reasons why it's such a good thing to add in terms of frequency is in particular because uh, when you're pushing a sled, you're not doing he heavy negatives uh, on the reps. Mm -hmm. It's all positive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good point. It's push, push, push. It's not push and lower, push and lower. And the negative portion of reps, although it is responsible for a lot of muscle growth, it's also responsible for a lot of muscle Most damage. damage yeah. So there is some some benefit. You can take advantage of that, right? You can take advantage of the fact that you can push something heavy and not get as much damage as if you were, you know, doing a squat or a lunge or something like that. Mm -hmm. And like Adam's saying, adding it to add volume and frequency, but without getting a lot of the damage, that's a great thing. That's a great benefit of it. Mm -hmm. Plus, there's a benefit of it in the sense that 
it's teaching you to, there is an elastic effect uh, when you lower a weight. And what I mean by that is if I'm in a squat and I lower the squat uh, and then squat it up, I can squat more weight doing it that way than if I get underneath a bar in the squatted position already and then come up because there is this energy storage that happens when you lower a weight. With the sled, you don't get that because I'm pushing. got to bring my leg back up and push again. So it can train you to be stronger without having to rely on that elastic effect, which if you're an athlete, is fucking excellent. That's great because in sports where you're taking off for a sprint or you're driving or whatever. You have to generate force. You got to generate force yeah. From a position where you're not, you know, storing all this right, you're elastic. not getting that elastic, yeah, potential. Exactly. So, yeah, sleds great way um, to add volume and frequency. I know we've done some videos on sleds, done, yeah. haven't we? Yeah, I think we've, we've done already a few, done like some of our very first ones. I think. Yeah, we've done some videos. Maybe we can do some more. You can check them out on YouTube on our channel. Yeah, I just I just TV. made a note on our because I made a note on a couple of things actually that we can do some some YouTube videos on uh, in regards to the stuff that we're talking about today. So we'll do maybe we'll do another series that's related to the sled that how, how other ways you can use because I think yeah. we, when we originally did it just basic you know here's driving, push, driving here's, pulling. Yeah, yeah, we just did the real basic how to do it, but we could also do. Um, you know, different ways to implement it into your programming. I think that would be a cool video. Right. Is, you oh, know, sure. More for strength and more, right. more for, yeah, conditioning because I use it for both. Right. So. I and use it for hypertrophy. I and mean, there's, hypertrophy. There's, there you go. So I think we could do a video on, on different ways to program it. I think that would be kind of cool. Quick commercial break. Hey, people ask us all the time how they can support Mind Pump. Here's what you can do. Uh, you can go to www.brain.fm forward slash mind pump and get 20% off Brain FM for meditation or focus. You can also go to audibletrial.com forward slash mind pump and get a 30 day trial plus one free audio book. Lastly, you can go to getnatureblend.com forward slash mind pump and you will get a discount on Ben Greenfield's CBD product. Next up is Galangster Nation. Galangster. Can oh, entrepreneurship be taught? Oh, if so, can you spot an individual who has huge potential as an entrepreneur? Is that something that people have to realize on their own? When did you guys realize that you were entrepreneurs? Yes, 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 and 12. <laughs> 12. <laughs> uh, um, uh, it's interesting. That's an interesting question. It's a good uh, question. Okay, so... I'm, uh, I, I tend to be more of a growth mindset uh, individual, at least I strive to be. And so I believe many things can be taught. I, I definitely think there's uh, individual um, you know, propensity for certain things, but can somebody learn how to be more of an entrepreneur through training and through coaching that if they never had that training and coaching, I definitely believe I so. Don't, but I, I also don't, think some people are just naturally better. I don't think it's a, an argument at all. I think it's yeah. no different than the way we talk about people being genetically gifted to be bodybuilders and be massive sure. and huge. Some people uh, have a genetic gift and are going to respond well to steroids, respond well to weights, and are going to look just absolutely... You're going to have people that just have this gift and talent. But I also think that you can build an incredible physique that could get up there and compete with some of the best, maybe not be the best, but compete with the best and not be as naturally gifted. The same thing works with entrepreneurship and this ability is some people were just born to lead, were born to create, were born to do these Born risk takers. Yeah, right? Just... We're born to do this. And you could argue that because I, I do think that a lot of these type of things are were developed in us as a as a young as a young child, like during that five to seven, seven years old. I I believe that there's things that happen to you that you didn't I, it took me a while before I unpacked this all the way to where I was five. And I've had people yeah. actually ask me this and sit me down and go like, Okay, we'll go further back. Like, what made you think this way? And so I shared this one time that, you know, I remember being a, a young kid, not having uh, having a lot uh, as far as, you know, money and things like that. And our family would, you know, would, would always talk about how it's, you know, it's all about love and God and family. And that was like, that was the core and everything else doesn't matter. And money is evil. And so I was taught that as a, at a very, very young age. But then I would see my, my friends that had, things and lots of money and and yet they were happy and they had all these things and so I started to make that connection at a very early age and then I saw the 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 work and the things they would do and I saw that you know this this my buddy's dad created this business and he did all these things and he had all this financial freedom and then this other friend created this business and did that and I started to see this 
And I thought like, I, you know, I, I want to, I want that. Like I want, I want that at an early age. And I, and I, and I know I, I made that connection early on. I didn't really notice it until I was older and that it probably stemmed all the way from those early years. Mm-hmm. So I do think that part of it is nature. Part of it is nurture. Um, I, I think that, um, I definitely think that it's not for everybody though. I think no. a lot of people think it sounds cool to to work uh no, for if, you, if you really break it down it's not cool. Yeah, we, <laughs> well startup companies is horrible. We, well, we've talked about this before, right? 80% fail. You know, 80% fail, 20% uh are successful. And then when you when when you measure 20%, the 20% a big portion of that <clears throat> and I forgot what the percentage was. I know I've read this somewhere. But a majority of that 20% only make like a get by making a living, you know, like enough to support them or their family, which is it's not like huge money. There's an even smaller fraction and we're getting in the like one percentile them that turn this their entrepreneurship or their business into a multi million dollar mm-hmm. company. So it's it's definitely uh glamorized a lot and- it, it is especially in um in american culture because you know we are a, you know capitalistic society so we see people who've you know done well for themselves as the ones that, that you know the big successes and we learn about them and read about them and it's very glamorized i've read a few studies on this um uh on this particular subject in particular and they've done studies they've done studies to identify what characteristics successful entrepreneurs have that are different than just everyday people. And there's like 14 or something that people have identified, but the ones that stick out to me the most are um, drive, drive and energy, uh, self-confidence, and a low fear of failure. So I'm gonna break those three down as, as, as to why I think those are the most important. Drive and energy, I think, is extremely important because you have to have a, an internal sense of motivation and desire to do what you do. When you work for someone else, you have a little bit of an external, it's more of an external drive, right? Your boss tells you, I want this, you know, this project finished. I want you to do this. I need you to complete that. And so you're driven by deadlines. You're driven by, you know, what someone else is kind of telling you to do. When you're an entrepreneur, you have to be driven to do that yourself. Uh, It's imagine going to school, never having to take a test, never having to take, you know, turn in homework. Like if you're passionate about the subject, you'll learn a lot. If you're not, you're not going to because you don't have to turn anything in. So that's one of the number one things. The second one I said was self-confidence. Self-confidence is very, very important in entrepreneurship because you literally have to believe that you are going to defy terrible odds. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because the odds are terrible. Odds are horrible. If you just if 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 statistically, it's a really bad idea. Statistically yeah. speaking, yeah. you're going to fail. Like that's just the, the just the statistics. As an entrepreneur, you have to have a healthy level of narcissism to where you believe that you are different than all the other eighty yeah. percent of failures. Like, well, okay, I know you everybody have to believe it hard. Yeah, like I know everybody fails, but I'm not going to fail because I'm me. So you have to have that belief, and it's not false. It needs to be a real sense of self confidence. Otherwise you would never be an entrepreneur in the first place. And then the la- the third one that I thought was really important is a low fear of failure. A, f- a really terrible, strong, strong fear of failure ha- will and has prevented many, many entrepreneurs from succeeding because I've used this example in the past, but uh, you know, we just, you know, it's like when you watch a boxing match and you watch a fighter fight to win versus a fighter who's fighting to not lose. You cannot go into business playing to not lose. Like I can't go in there just trying not to fail, trying not to shut down my business, trying not to fail because at best you'll you'll maybe you know be okay to where maybe you're not in the red and you'll just have this kind of subpar business. At best, what's more likely is you'll end up failing versus going in there thinking I'm here to win, yeah. I'm here to succeed. By all means necessary. Totally different thought process different decision process. It's a very, very different way of being. So those are the three things that I've identified as being the most important. And I've seen people like this who've worked for me Mm -hmm. in the past. And by the way, you could be a great leader. You could have all this amazing leadership potential, but that doesn't mean you're going to be an entrepreneur either. You could just maybe a great leader within the business. I've worked with both, both types of people and, and, 
you know, I've, I've worked in, in different companies where, you know, immediately I knew inherently and, and would still bulldoze through because of the way I am. But uh, I knew inherently, like, if we're starting to add all these these risks and we're, we're trying to mitigate our risk right from the very beginning, that's a bad sign. Mm. You're not an entrepreneur. Like, you're not cut out for this shit. Like, well, that's all they focus on. They're that just was the, the main focus, right? Yeah. It's the main focus. And everything they can do, they have the plan, the plan, the plan, the plan. And um, it just, in my in my experience, is, has never worked out for the best. Um, but on on the flip side to that, you know, so very skillful, very much knowledgeable, you know, but it, it, it's like it's hard for people to realize that this is a totally different animal and that, you know, these same skills and applications that have gotten you so far working for a company, like completely don't translate to entrepreneurship. Mm. So it, it it's a humbling thing. You know, it's a humbling thing for a lot of people to, you know, go through that. So I give props to anybody that at least tries it out. And they're, you know, in that other type of personality where like they really thrive more working for somebody. And, I can, and, and you can be in the middle, by the way. Like you mm-hmm. can... You can have a job that is entrepreneurial like, but is not full on entrepreneurship. Like you could be like a real estate agent where you work with, you know, brokers, you you work for, you know, whatever, you know, Century 21 or whatever, and you 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 still have to be self-motivated, but you but you also have some of the tools. Owning a franchise, that's a little bit more entrepreneur, but you still have the, you know, products provided for you. You have the training materials, you have the advertising provided for you. So that's another step. That's sort so of there's hybrid, different, I guess. Yeah. yeah. There's different levels of entrepreneurship, um, that you can embark on. I, I um, can, I can definitely spot somebody, especially by their verbiage. Hmm. Like when you talk to somebody who's having a challenge in business, how they talk about their challenges tells me so much about if they're a true entrepreneur or not. Because it's crazy. You'll see a lot of people who get into entrepreneurship thinking that they are for it. And then you ask them about their business or things that are going on. And when they explain the struggles or the hard parts or the things that they're not doing well, or they put a facade on like they're doing so much better than what they were all. So the, the, the fake entrepreneur fakes his, fakes how good he's doing or blames uh, all these other mm. factors on the the lack of their success versus owning why their business or what they're trying to do is not succeeding, which I think, uh, and that kind of ties back to some of the things that Sal was saying, that you, you've got to be this, this person who is okay with failure and embraces it when it happens. Like, fuck yeah, that was a stupid decision I made. Like, I made that decision. I thought this was best for my business. Fucked up on to the next thing. Like, this is what I'm doing now, you know? Yep. And you and you own those failures versus, oh, you know, just the market isn't really good right now and just I'm having a real hard... I mean, I ordered this and it was supposed to come through and it was just not, you know, and, you know, people are totally trying to... with Blaming everybody else, but what you're currently doing. So I, I can always tell somebody uh, that was meant to do it. I mean, when I look at uh, the team that we're building here now, I mean, I tell you what, like in, in the, at least in our space, in the fitness industry, I'll put our starting five against anybody else's starting five. That's how confident I feel about who who I work with and the team of entrepreneurs power forward, that, we've, you know. that we've put – uh, and surrounded ourselves with all the way down to people that are behind the scene that people don't know about that. I mean, the, these people are all the, the, the core that we have now are all individual entrepreneurs that are respond. And we knew that if we were going to grow this thing to something great, that it would require that. Like we're not even, we're barely getting to the place where we have people on staff that are uh, just there for little jobs that pay like our hourly wage that just, okay, you do this and that's all you do. And we don't need thinkers and entrepreneurs mm-hmm. that are wanting to help grow this because this thing needs to grow. Yeah. Right. Ask, ask yourself if you're wondering this, first of all, if you're wondering if you're an entrepreneur or not, mm, I don't know. Is that a bad sign? Maybe. Well, I, he- I tend to think entrepreneurs tend to be like, yes, but then again, self doubt tends to kick in a little bit, but ask yourself this, uh, how much do you value autonomy? You know, how much do you value the ability for you to do whatever you want and make decisions on your own? If you list your things of your priorities in terms of here's the most important things that I value in my career and autonomy is not number one, then you probably shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Do you read the instructions? Yeah. 
<laughs> that's a good, well, that's well, a good determiner. Uh, entrepreneurs value autonomy more than anything. I have. T- I'll tell you something right now. I have made fucking way less money because I valued autonomy over a paycheck. Where I'm like, you know, I had offers to work for companies who were going to pay me way more money than I was making, but I couldn't fathom the idea of not having that autonomy. I'd rather make less and have my own freedom to do what I'm going to do with my belief and my potential. Which I think the the 20% that I was talking about earlier fall in that category. A majority of them, it uh, to be honest, are just okay with, hey, you know what? I probably could go work for another company and make more money, but I like that. I like the ability to come and go as I please, take vacations when I want, work extra hard when I want to make more money, let off the throttle and make less money when I don't want to. And I enjoy that freedom and I'm okay with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think you 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 it, there, it's plenty okay to be uh, to have that mindset. I think there's a um I think a lot of people mistake that you you know you're going to come in and you're going to make all this money uh by you know running your own business and they don't realize how <laughs> no. how, how challenging it, it really is, you know. What about when you guys first realized that you were like what what do you remember the I know I just was joking. Oh I bro, I was I, I was day 1, 100%. Like uh, when I first started working as a personal trainer, uh, I, you know, I did very well right off the bat, quickly became bored, fitness manager, did real well, got bored, went into sales, managed gyms, quickly got bored, bought my own and that was it. So I was 21 years old when I first became an entrepreneur and I realized very quickly, and, my, and the good managers, by the way, and this is a hats off to some of the excellent managers I've worked for. You know, Don Cardona was one of them. John Romeo was another one. Dean Pappas was even like this with me, where uh, Reggie Allison was like this even, where uh, they recognized early on, if they left me the fuck alone, that I would do great. If they came up and tried to manage me, that I would so, I would just perform terribly because I could not stand it. And that's, that's, that's a, uh, I think that may be a, uh, a trait amongst entrepreneurs like, Leave me alone. Let yeah. me do my thing. Yeah, trust me. And I will do way better. Oh my god! Than That's if you're like on my, my ass. life story. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't even realize that because that was always like how it went for me in every sport I was at. Like so, uh, coaches quickly realized that the less they coached me, the better I performed. And you know, it came to a point where sometimes I would have to actually explain that, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I would tell them, you know, what time it was. But like, and and I never. Uh, also, I never quit anything ever. Like that was one thing that always stuck with me. Like you know, through the times, of the the you know, I would persevere uh, regardless. And I know that's like more of an athlete type of a trait, but I feel like that definitely applies uh, into business. And, and like you said, being scared of failure. Right? Ooh, so can we talk about that? I've for- never. I just that's just something I I thrive in failure. You know, like I, I want I want to press my boundaries and and work my way through tough times. You just reminded me of a big mistake I think I see so many entrepreneurs make too. Is And I think I've said this before on the podcast about loving your ideas and not marrying them. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the statistics on the the fail rate, right, of, you know, 80%, and if you are an entrepreneur and you're going to be that, even if you are that guy and or girl, uh Every every millionaire or really really successful entrepreneur that I ever met, uh, none of them. I don't know one. I'm sure there is one out there, but I don't know a single one that hit it out the park the first time. Nope. Most of them have had racked up uh, tons of failures first, and so uh, I think another mistake that some entrepreneur or some aspiring entrepreneurs make is they have a passion for like a job, like let's say personal training and that's what they want to be. And so they're like, Oh, I want to be a trainer and I love helping people and I want to run my own business. I don't want to work for anybody else. And so they try and run their business and their ideas or their way of running their business is, is failing. And you're either growing or dying, which first, just so you know, so if you're looking and you're reflecting on your own business and you're not growing, you're fucking dying. Mm. And it's hard for people to swallow that. And then the next hard thing to swallow is maybe I should not marry this idea and I should move on to the next one because I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a serial entrepreneur and I'm okay with the fact that this idea failed and I'm on to the next one and I'll see how that works and I'm going to apply that. And I see people hang on to things. You got to be okay with being wrong. Right. That's such, such a big totally. thing. Like, you know, that's where the self confidence I think comes in because mm-hmm. 
you can be self-confident with an idea and be like, this is the greatest idea ever. I'm going to put this out and it's going to fucking work. And then it doesn't work. And now you're like, I'm, I'm crushed. I'm not going to try again. Whereas real self-confidence is, this is a great idea. I know it's going to work. Oh, it doesn't work. I know I can figure out a different way yeah, now. Yeah, figure out a different way. I can, exactly. Maybe it's at another time. Maybe it's, you know, whatever it is. Like, you know, you, you, like you say, you don't marry yourself to that as like the one failure equals, mm. equals zero. It's actually comical if you think about it. It's really comical. Like when I, when we started Mind Pump, okay, we started this podcast, all of us in this room had almost zero knowledge of podcasting. <laughs> we had almost zero knowledge of how to apply it, even what listen to, do. to the radio. We, yeah, <laughs> we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. We didn't know the, the odds. We didn't even look up the odds. I think we just said, let's just do this. Um, and we've learned a lot of lessons along the way totally. and it's been okay. It's been, that's been a great process. Looking back, it's comical. Like if you go back, if we had a group of guys that came in right now and told us, you know, Hey guys, we love mind pump. We want to start a podcast. And you yeah. say, Oh, what's your experience? What's what do you your know? process? And they said, well, I don't know. We don't yeah. know. We'd be like, you're, well, you're an idiot. Like that. You don't know anything, but that was us. That was literally us. We knew nothing yep. of what we we're going to do, except the fact that we felt we had a, we had a passion for what we we're going to do. And we were confident in what we we're going to do. And we were okay with failing. In fact, when, and we've told this story before, when Mind Pump, when we first started Mind Pump, we had a major setback before we even launched the show. We mm-hmm. had a major, major setback. And uh, I'll tell the story again because it's been a while since we told the, told the story. But when we started the show, there were four hosts. Uh, Craig Caperso was one of the original hosts of the Mind Pump that was never launched. And we recorded... 15 episodes with him. That's a substantial amount of episodes. That's a lot of episodes for people who've never recorded episodes before, yeah. especially. Well, think about that. It's at least at least 15 hours worth of recording work and then Doug's backhand work. I mean, it's a, it's a good amount of work it's, put in just to- Not going. only is it that, but a big part of our original plan, a huge part when you write your business plan out, which we didn't write one out, but we talked about it, a huge part of the business plan that was going to give us- a chance at succeeding was Craig Capurso's social media presence. His social media presence destroyed all of ours combined. Second closest with Adams, it was Adams, and Adams wasn't even anywhere near the ballpark of Craig's. And so we were like, okay, we understood that in order to make it in social media or podcast or whatever, you want to have some kind of a foothold, and that was Craig. And right before our launch, Craig calls us up, drops out, doesn't want to do it because he's afraid his sponsors aren't going to like it, whatever. We have to start over from scratch. I got, We got the text. All of us got the text. I read the text and I was like, fuck, we lost our social media presence. So now we're just going to fucking launch in the dark. Uh, what are we going to do now? We've already recorded 15 episodes. We have to start from scratch. I was fully prepared to have a motivating conversation with both Adam and Justin and Doug, I was going to get on the phone with everybody and try to convince them to keep moving forward. That was my idea. Like, okay, well, I'm not going to fucking stop. I'm going to have to talk these guys into it. I got on the phone before I could open my mouth, before a word can come out of my mouth. It was either Adam or Justin that was like, fuck it. We're going to start over yeah, literally. And the other guy was like, let's do it. And I was like, holy fuck. Like, this is beautiful. This is an amazing thing. And of course, looking back, it was all serendipitous because it worked out the way it should. But you know that's just that's just and it's been like that the road has been like that this entire time we've 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 <laughs> we've done m- most of the successes we've had with mind pump were you know adam likes to call us idiot savants because we just kind of Sur- like servants servants yeah it's a new word <laughs> yeah. uh, because we don't we don't you know but we're we're doing it we're going at it i think there's an there's an element of artist that comes out as an entrepreneur as well totally to where you are you have to be innovative yeah and you're just passionate about yeah. your idea and that just drives you you're so passionate about it that it it drives you to create and do and whatever you're gonna do regardless of the money because i'll tell you something right now we, we recorded mind pump episodes for a fucking year before we made a dime yeah we would meet up and devote hours of our time to doing the show, editing it. Doug had a job, full-time job. I've got kids. Justin's got kids. We're all doing other things. And why did we do it? Because we loved it. We were passionate about it. Like, And I'll be honest with you, Mind Pump could reduce its its production of revenue by 90-something percent. I'll probably still want to do it. It's a fucking great time. So there's a lot of things that drive you as an entrepreneur 
that you don't have that external motivation. It's kind of within you. Did you guys ever go, because I actually had a moment growing up where I didn't want to be. So at one point, uh, you know, the very first thing I ever did to make money for myself was when I was 15 years old. My mom had a drive. It was me and my, my best friend at the time. We started a, a lawn mowing service, and uh, went it's always do- what we start. Right? Yeah, it went door to door and and got all these these lawns. these accounts, and you know we didn't have our license, so our you know my mom would we'd we'd put the lawn mower in the back of my mom's minivan, and she would drop us off at the end of the street, and we would basically push ourselves from door to to the each account that we had that we because we went previously before that door to door flyering knock. We actually knocked on doors and talked to the people, which was. Let me tell you, it was probably one of the smartest things we did as a 15-year-old boy. At that time, I don't think we realized that that, how smart that was, but I think back now, like, God, if two young 15-year-old boys, like, knocked on my door and, like, were trying to start a business where they had their flyer and they're like, this is what we do, like, I'd have a hard time saying no, (laughs) Yeah, I could say no to that. Right, right. So, uh, like, such a... We've met a couple people, a couple kids who I've been impressed with. One was the young lady from the um, Actually Adultish podcast. Like, this girl's just... uh, She's a little hustler. You could see she's got that that entrepreneurial drive and spirit, mm-hmm. and she'll probably do well at some point doing something. Sure. And then there was that other kid I can't remember his name, uh, who he was he has a podcast as well, and he was the one with the nut butter. Oh yeah, Travis Mar- yeah. Mar- Mar- He's also got that like you you can sense it in him. He's got totally. that where yeah. you meet him He's and you're hungry. like yeah. you're like oh fuck you're gonna do you're gonna do pretty well so. Yeah, yeah. you you can tell. But For I sure. went so that's how I started right. So that's like 15 years old. Then when I was uh, 16, 17, and 18, I worked on the dairy at the, at a, on a ranch, and I was pretty much like the ranch hand. So I was like, the, you know, they, I did everything. It was everything from shoveling shit to welding to, you know, orchard stuff to milking cows, you name it. So, and I and I got to know the, the family really well, and it was a husband and wife, and they had three kids. And uh, it, I got close enough to actually get to see them open their books and I saw, I saw the revenue that they made and you know uh, how much uh, how much money it took to run the business and it really discouraged me because you know as in, when you're a young kid and you're an employee and you're just getting your check every week you think and, they're just fucking rolling right it's the same I, it's the same thing I know that we I have already felt that from people with with mind pump that just think like you know oh because they have the studio and they have this and that they're like oh they're just revenue is just they got all kinds of money that they have like no it doesn't work that way like that's just not how business works like you know the the more you got going on the more revenue that is is going out to provide all that and that gave me a a new perspective on on this and i was like man fuck they don't get any they didn't have any days off they were 7 days a week mm-hmm. year round 7 days a week could never cuz cows got to be milked twice a day twice a day them suckers got to got to get milked and i was there i was there i was hired on there so was another friend of mine so they had two employees uh, that worked for them and we were there to give them some sort of relief so they didn't have to literally work seven days a week so they could actually take one day off every now and then. But they made just enough money to give themselves a day or two off, not even enough money to go put themselves on a family vacation or even leave or doing like that. So I was just so fascinated by what it took for them to have to provide for their family and even be able to pay a four dollar you know 450 an hour you know kid you know two kids to come in and work you know part time for them and and see the the life they lived and i thought fuck i don't know if i i want yeah, this yeah this. I, I don't know and, and you know they worked hard and they I, they were organic milk dude they were they were the fifth uh organic dairy in california at the time so there was only five four others at the time so talk about even having a brilliant idea ahead we had, way ahead of the time we yeah. had organic almonds we had organic milk and this was that's actually how i learned about organic i didn't even know what organic was yeah. in, until this time because at that point it was at the very beginning and so talk about and both of them had their degrees so they were both very smart um hard working had a great I- idea and vision on where the market was going and uh, that business no longer exists. That they they have that house there, and the dairy has been shut down. I haven't talked to them in a really long time, That's and I, too bad. I know they went different directions. But you know, I saw them run that business for about ten years. Ten years, they they ran it like that, and never saw 
this, you know, never made tons of money. It would mm-hmm. just, they basically just got by yeah. and worked their asses off just to get by. And that gave me a, a whole new perspective on yeah, entre- reality check. Yeah, it on, wasn't so glamorized. A, exactly. And yeah. it really gut checked me on, do I want that? You know, do I, do I really want something that could potentially I could be doing that I love or is my idea, mm-hmm. but may just put me in a position to just get by. And I think a lot of people, uh, think they want to get entre- be an entrepreneur because again it's glamorized you think that you know re- it results in all this money and vacation and traveling and it, you know when when reality slaps you in the face no, and you, you find, don't take vacations right you, know, you don't you, take money out of the business <laughs> if you do that you know you're done like right. your business is done so and it's tough most will tell you most uh entrepreneurs especially successful ones will tell you they've worked harder and more hours uh, for themselves than they ever did for another person. Right. So, you know, I think you got to have a lot of people got to have a gut check uh, first before they decide, are you really an entrepreneur yeah. or not? And, and the, the, the real, uh, like just born to be like entrepreneurs, you can't talk them out of it anyway. You know what I mean? Like we could have this conversation all day. Someone could have this conversation with me yeah. and say, listen, Sal, fucking impossible you're yeah. gonna fail it's expensive this that, hard and times and i'm gonna look at them and shake my head and be like yeah but i'll i'll, I'll be different like yeah it, you know th- those true it's entrepreneurs make me a better human being i think they're gonna be entrepreneurs no matter well, what. well i i mean mm-hmm. i the other day i was rattling off the stats right I, I don't know if we released that episode yet or not i know it will come by the time this one does um about the you know people how many people run a you know hundred million dollar company and how small of a number that is. And that doesn't scare me. That excites the fuck out of somebody like me. Cause yeah. I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to be one of the one of the only people the, that uh, elite yeah. group. Yeah. So you you have to be somebody that gets that, right? That someone tells you, no, it's so hard as that. Right. And it excites you, it doesn't scare you. If it scares you, you might want to look deeper well, into that. Especially it, the self-made guys. Right. If, if it turns you on, there, like, yeah. ooh, yeah, fuck yeah. You mean to tell me that 1% of the 1%ers get there? Fucking A, I want to do that. You know, yeah. versus, oh shit, I didn't realize it's that hard. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. it's exciting. Uh, check this out. Go to YouTube. That's where you'll find some of the videos that we've referenced in this episode. It's Mind Pump TV. Subscribe to the channel. It's actually blowing up at the moment. Our YouTube channel is starting to get really, really popular. It's uh, tons of content. There's a new video every single day. Also, if you'd like to ask us a question that we answer on an episode like this one, go to Instagram, go to our page, Mind Pump Media, find the meme that says Q&A and ask the question underneath. Make sure to hashtag Qua, Q U. A-H. And finally, we all have Instagram pages. My page is Mind Pump Sal. Adam is Mind Pump Adam. Justin is Mind Pump Justin. And I'll throw a little shout out to Doug. He's got a cool little page, Mind Pump Doug. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes Maps Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. Mind Pump.